God is good. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Lord, we bless you. We adore you. Father, we glorify your name. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and your grace, O oh God. Thank you because you are Lord and no one else is. Lord, we thank you for the privilege even to come into your presence, O oh God, today. This first Sunday of March, Father, we are grateful. Many have been called home, O oh God. Many who were much better than us, much more righteous than us, much, much holier than us, they have been called home. But Lord, because of your mercy, you have kept us here. Lord, please accept our thanksgiving, O oh God. Lord, we ask, O oh God, that you will speak to us today. Reveal yourself. Let no one live here the same way they have come. But meet every one of us at the point of our needs. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I don't mind the sound this morning. It's, uh, it's not where it should be. It's nowhere near it. Hallelujah. Ask your neighbor, do you know him? Do you know him? Come on, ask somebody, do you know him? Do you know him? Hallelujah. You know, one thing I've come to realize and find out is the knowledge of Christ in our lives determines the type of life we live. Can I say that again? Yeah. The knowledge of Christ in our lives determines the type of life that we live. If we know him, you know, we live better. But one thing I've come to understand, I'm, I'm going to go back to that scripture, is that most of us have what is called his acts. We know his acts, but we don't know him. We know what he does. We know what he can do, but we still don't know him. You know, in Moses, Moses, talking about Moses, somebody said about Moses knew his ways. But the children of Israel knew his acts. And, you know, I began to com compare both. What was different about Moses and the people? The thing there was that the people were easy to turn around from God. They could turn away from God in the twinkle of an eye and say, Oh, we want to go back to Egypt. In the twinkle of an eye, they could repent of knowing God and say, No, we want no more part of you. But Moses, from the time God revealed himself to him until the very end, Moses never turned back once. Even when God judged him and said, You will see the land, you will not enter. Moses did not say, well, Lord, if that's the case, I'm done with you. Moses said, let your will be done. Because Moses understood the, uh, the, the ways of God. There is a difference between knowing his ways and knowing his heart. Even an unbeliever knows his heart. They've heard that God does miracles. And that's why they go around looking for places where miracles are happening. Even some believers will only go to where, they, where it is, in quote, miracle, miraculous. But that is not what God has called us to. God wants us to know his ways. In the ways of God, you will encounter miracle. You will not search for miracle. You know, then that, that led me to begin to understand the scripture that says, goodness and mercy will follow us. When we know his ways, goodness and mercy will follow. But when we don't know his ways and all we know are his acts, guess what happens? We run after goodness and mercy. And you know the sad part of it? When you, when you run after something, the closer you get, the farther it looks as if it, it's getting. Is that not so? It's like a, a dog... That you put a stick, you tie a stick to its head, and you put a bone at the front of that stick. The dog is always seeing this bone, smelling the bone, but never able to taste the bone. Never able to, because it's always a little bit ahead. But when you know the ways of God, hallelujah, God brings those things to you. You don't run after them, he brings them to you, hallelujah. And that's why this morning, I'm, I'm asking the question, do you know him? Hallelujah. The knowledge of God is the greatest thing you can ever imagine. 
Psalm 103 verse 7. He says, He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. God made known his ways. Let me tell you something. The only way you're going to know him is when God opens his arms up to you. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. The Bible says those who come unto him, he will in no wise cast out. When you come, he opens up his arm. But when you stay away, his arm is folded. So in order to know God, you have to seek him. That's why the Bible, the scriptures declare that those who seek the Lord, they must seek him with everything. You love the Lord with all your might, with all your power, with all your strength. Hallelujah. And that's how you find him. That's how you begin to know his ways. Let's go into the scriptures this morning. Again, Exodus 33. From verse 13 to 14 and then 18 to 23. This is Moses now talking to the Lord. This is the point where Moses begins to come into the full knowledge of the Lord. He says, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. What was Moses praying for? To know his way. Remember, this same Moses already had a personal encounter that nobody had with the Lord. He was there at the burning bush. The Bible says the bush was burning, but it did not burn. And God said, take off the sandal of your feet, for where you are is holy. And so he had a, a, an experience with God. What he did at that point in time was he came into the acts of God. God showed up as a burning fire that was not burning, and God spoke to him. And after Moses had walked with the Lord, you know, and he had already even gone to Egypt, he had done miracle signs and wonders. Then Moses began to think, there is more to this God than all these acts. Do you understand? You know, I, I, I was watching a movie, and somebody said, so, actually a, a series. And the person said, the most difficult thing to hide is you. Did you hear what I said? The most difficult thing to hide is you. He said you can act. You can act in a certain way and you think, oh yes, I'm deceiving people. But in you, you know you have not changed and you are still you. And that all you're doing is a facade. is acting. And so, Moses here realized that, look, I'm able to do all these things for God, but I don't know him. No matter what you do for God, until you know him, you will never understand the reason why, why not, and how he does what he does. You will always be like, well, you know, there are some people, if you don't answer me, I'm going to do this. Well, do what you want to do. God is like, okay, after you've done it, you come back. But when you know him and some things don't happen, you know. You know you still got your peace. Tell somebody, I know I still got my peace. I still got my joy. What did not happen cannot take away my peace or my joy. Hallelujah. Because I know him. And so Moses said, now that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And in verse 14, God said, my presence will go with you and i will give you rest hallelujah god told him my presence now at that point in time moses should be satisfied now if god comes to any of us and says my presence will be with you always hello are we still going to pray and say lord i still want to know you more when he has already said my presence will be with you we're like well i don't need nothing else if your presence is there but Moses understands and understood the fact that the presence of God does not necessarily mean the ways of God. The presence of God is a manifestation of his heart. Do you understand? The fact that God is there with you is the manifest manifestation of God's actions. And so the enemy knows God is there with you. But do you know? Even if God is there with you, there are some things that when you see, you will doubt that presence of God with you. And that's why God told, that's why God told Moses, he said, listen, these people, even though my presence is with you guys, 
I will not take them through the short way. He said, lest they see walls and they turn around. So even, can you imagine? He parts the Red Sea. He does all he wants to do. And he's leading them and they are still afraid. And that's what happened when they got to the Red Sea. There was a pillar of fire that separated uh, the enemy from them. There was a pillar of cloud that was leading ahead. And when they came to the Red Sea, they said Moses brought them here to kill them. Because all they have seen were the acts of God in Egypt. They saw uh, water become blood. They saw frogs on land. They saw locusts. You know, they saw different things. They saw the killing of the firstborn. They saw hearts. But they never experienced the Lord. I pray today that somebody will have a personal experience in the name of Jesus. Amen. Then jump to verse 18. And he said, please, this is Moses now. Moses is saying, I know your presence is good. Your presence is everything. And then Moses now said, please, show me your glory. He said, show me your glory. The glory of God is the personification of God. The glory of God is not an action anymore. The glory of God is who God is. And that's what Moses was now craving for. He said, show me your glory. It's like somebody saying, show me who you are. Reveal yourself truly to me. And that revelation of you is the ultimate. And that's what Moses was now craving from God. He said, I want to know you. And the only way I can get to know you is to see you. Hallelujah. And then in verse 19. Then he said, God said, I will make all my goodness, that is all my essence, everything about me, I will make it pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. You see that? Uh, my goodness acts, the name of the Lord, part of it. It says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 20. But he said, God said, you cannot see my face. He says, for no man shall see me and leave. But he says, while my glory passes, that is, while my acts and my essence and everything else passes, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I will cover you with my hand while I pass. And I will take away my hand so you can see my back. My face shall not be seen. Until you see a part of a person, you can never understand that person. You know, if I come up and I describe somebody for you now, you know, you know the, the, the normal descri the, uh, description of the black man. When something happens, yeah, uh, black man, average height, wearing hoodie. That's it. And Unfortunately, every black man in that area falls into that category. <laughs> everybody falls into that category. Because for some reason, everybody is black, average height, and wearing hoodie. <laughs> Likewise, but when you see the face of a person, when you were there, when that thing takes place, and you see the fullness of that person's face, then you can say, yes. Well, uh, the, the definition is black man, average height, wearing hoodie, but he's bald. He has no hair. He has moustache and he has white beard. He has brown eyes. You see how detailed the definition starts coming out. He has a black ring on his hand and you describe him well. When you see the part of a person, that's when you begin to see the essence of that person. And that's what God showed Moses. He said, even though nobody can see my face, but I can show you a part of me that when you see, you will know that you have experienced me. And that is the ways of God. You know, you, know you can identify a person by the, time, by the way they walk, by their backside. You know that? If somebody is going, ah, that's pastor. If, sorry, Dickiness Favor, where is she? Sorry. If she's going and everything is bumping up, you know, that's Dickiness Favor. <laughs> is that a... <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, by the back of a person, you can identify that person. And that's why God showed Moses his backside. 
and Moses was able to identify, okay, this is God. He now had that experience. And Moses began to know the ways of the Lord. The way of the Lord is a personal experience with the Lord. It is not something that can be shared. Remember, Moses was given the privilege of seeing the backside of the Lord. Some people have been privileged to see the front side of the Lord without his face. Some have been privileged to see the uh, right side. That's why there's a scripture in the Bible that talks about the approach of God. Some says he has the face of an eagle. Some says, oh, he's like a lion. Some say, oh, he's this. Are they wrong? No. Everybody has a different experience. No two people, let me say this, no two people must have the same experience of God. That's, the revelation becomes personal. When your experience is different from mine. When mine is different from yours. When I know, you know, like Daniel said, they that know their God, they will be strong and they will do exploit. The knowledge of God that I have will be so different from yours. But when we come together, we can bring it all together to create a force. But we all must have that personal knowledge of God. You know, still talking about that knowledge. In Mark chapter 8 verse 27. Mark 8 27. Jesus, and Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, listen to this, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? Verse 28, and they answered, Oh, some say you are John the Baptist. These guys have heard people. Some said, oh, that's John the Baptist reason. Some said, oh, no, 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 you are, Eli you are, you are Elijah. You know, the Bible says Elijah must come back again. They say, some, some have said, you are Elijah. Jesus said, okay. But listen to this. And, one of the, and some say one of the prophets. And Jesus now said to them, thank you for what others have said. What, who do you say that I am? Let me, put, let me tell you something there. There were 12 disciples walking with him. There were 12 of them. And they were all supposed to have had a personal encounter with him. Is that not so? But do you know what? 11 of them have only seen his acts. 11 of them have only, you know, they've seen Jesus perform miracles. They were there at the feeding of the, of the 5,000, of the 4,000. You know, they were always there when he did something miraculous. But none of them experienced him personally. And so when the question was posed, who do you think that I am? Look at the only person that answered. Then, and Peter, you know, if you read, he, he said to all of them, Bible said at 29, and he said to, unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art Christ. That was the only person with a revelation of who Jesus was at that point in time. The others knew his acts. They did not know his ways. But Jesus knew his ways. Remember, Jesus would take them to the mountain to pray. There were times when he would separate the twelve, take only three with him to pray but out of them all they all still did not know his ways they only knew his heart the the, the the ways of god are revealed by revelation and then look at what jesus said he says thou art christ and he charged them that they should tell no man of him of who he is when you have a personal encounter with christ a personal revelation of who christ is to you it becomes personal. Did you hear what I said? It is not something you want everybody to know because it's your own closest knowledge. Amen. Tell somebody, it's my closest knowledge. And you know, you wear it like uh, uh, as you wear pride. You step out knowing, yes, he's with me because I know him. Hallelujah. In Exodus 3, 1 again, when Jesus was, God, uh, God was revealing himself to Moses and to the children of Israel. He said, Moses said, who are you? Who should I tell them sent me? He said, I am who I am. Let's break it down. Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. Let's break it down. I am who I am. 
That means if you say, uh, if pastor, you say he's the healer, he says, I'm the healer. If you have received, if, you, if your revelation of me is the healer, then I'm the healer. If your revelation is, I'm the provider, I am the provider. If your revelation is, uh, I am the protector, then I am the protector. If your revelation is, I am the one that opens doors, I am the one that opens doors. And that's what that statement means. I am who I am. So I am who you call me. I am who I have revealed myself to you as. And do you know the revelation of who God in your, is in your life carries you a long way. We're going to see something, you know, we say Jehovah Jireh, our provider, Jehovah this. Some people experienced him and he was revealed to them as a provider. And they moved with that all the days of their life. Jump, jump let's go quickly to the book of uh, Genesis. Genesis 16, 13. Let's start. We, we had the preacher preach about this. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. This is where God is called uh, the God who sees me. It was Agar that had this experience. Agar was not supposed to be in the lineage of Israel. But she had an encounter with God. A personal revelation that made her declare, you are the God that sees me. I you know some of us wrong, most of us wrong with that, oh God sees me. But have you encountered him in such a way that he sees you? Or have you seen him because he says, you see me and I see you. Hallelujah. Jump again to Genesis 22, verse 8. And then we'll read 13 and 14. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. This was when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, his son. And so the two of them went together. In verse 13, then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. And so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide as it is to this day. We all say the Lord our provider. But guess what? Abraham encountered the Lord as his provider in his dearest moment. When he was on his way to sacrifice his only son. So if God did not provide this lamb, Abraham would have got in there and would have had to sacrifice his son. But Abraham knew God. Tell your neighbor, Abraham knew God. He knew God would do no evil. He knew God was not wicked. He knew God was not going to take the blood of his son. He knew. And so he was like, son, let's go. I know this God. I have relationship with him. I know. Let's go. He said, I should sacrifice you. We will see. If I, if I have to sacrifice you, then he will wake you up immediately. So Abraham was 100% sure because of his relationship with God that something was going to take place. And so that's why when his son asked him, Father, there is firewood and there is knife. Where is the animal we're going to kill? Abraham did not say, Son, uh, sit down, let me explain to you. The Lord said I should take you to go and sacrifice you. To go and kill you. Do you know if he had told his son that, that boy will run. If he can fight him, he will fight him like no man's business. And guess what? If that boy makes it home and tells his mother, Abraham better not come back home. <laughs> if, for no reason, Abraham should not return to that house. Because if that woman feeds him, he better be sure he's eating poison. Because the woman will be like, you want to kill my son, right? It's better you die before you kill my son. Hallelujah. But he told the boy, he said, God will provide for himself. Look at that. And when God provided for himself, what happened? He called the place, the name of the place, uh, the, the mount, the Lord, the Lord will provide. Hallelujah. The Lord will provide. Another one in Psalm 23 verse 1. You know, this is the one we read a lot. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's David acknowledging that God is Jehovah Ra. He's his shepherd. You know, and I began to think about it. That means David had a revelation when he was taking care of his sheep. And that's why David could easily relate to God as a shepherd. That's why David knew God as his shepherd. And let me prove it to you. Go if David was watching over the animals, right? And God was watching over him. When the bear came, David said, I tore out the I tore the mouth of the bear and I took out the lamb that he had it, he wanted to swallow. Was it David? It was God. David knew it was God. When the lion, the man eater came, David said, I did the same. David realized that in all of this, even though he was the shepherd, it was God who was his own shepherd. Because the work of the shepherd is to protect the sheep, is to defend the sheep. And so while he was there, God was protecting and defending him. And with that revelation, David came against Goliath. He said, you have no idea who I serve. He said, you come against me with spear and with all this. He said, I come against you in the name of the Lord. The Lord of hosts, whose army you have defiled. And David went and he prevailed. The knowledge of God will take you into battle with victory ahead of you. Do you understand? When you are still afraid of going into certain battles, you know, that's why, you know, I say this, to God be the glory. I don't pray when there is a problem, you know. I don't react to problem with the same way of prayer. You know, some of us, when something begins, ah, da, 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 then we don't sleep, we don't eat, we start fasting, and then we start praying, elter, skelter, we scatter, we destroy, we bombash, we bombash, we, we debash, we de Hello, that's praying in fear. But you see, when situations show up, I just begin to worship. I begin to praise. And I still pray normally. Because I found out that my prayer... Whether I increase the temple or reduce the temple or fire the temple, it does not move God. It's only moving me. It's only making me feel as if, yes, I'm doing something. You know that prayer that makes you feel like you're doing something? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you swear, are you, yeah, yeah. It makes you, only you feel like as if you're doing something. That prayer does not move God. Relationship moves God faster than those type of prayers living a life of holiness a life of righteousness a life of fellowship moves god faster than you just jumping into prayer kabash 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 and when the situation is solved you go back into your sin life he does not move god do you understand and that's relationship david understood the fact that god was already his shepherd that's why David went into every battle seeking the face of the Lord. And he even showed us his weakness. David showed us his weakness. When his family was kidnapped and everything, the Bible said the men cried. David joined them to cry. He said when all of them had cried all day till evening, then David said, okay, enough. David began to encourage himself. He said crying will not bring them back. And he began to encourage himself. And I believe what David was saying is, you are my shepherd. While I was in the wilderness, you protected me. You protected the animal I, I, I was with. You gave me victory over Goliath. Lord, you are great. He began to encourage himself. And during that process, he remembered, I can still ask God and talk to God. And he called the prophet. He said, go and bring the ephod. He said, ask God, should I go and pursue these people? The prophet said, God. Said yes. He said, Will I recover all? The prophet said, Yes. He said, That's all I need. God, here we go. And he went and he recovered all. Relationship will give you instructions that shouting up and down will not give you. Most battles in life are fought and won by obeying simple instructions. You know, the man of God came the other day and he told us, He said, Listen, he said, He does not pray for prosperity. He says, all I do is I simply obey the principles of prosperity that God has put in the Bible. You know what? You don't pray for protection if you observe the principle of protection in the Bible. Can I tell you the simple principle? 
He that breaks the edge, the serpent will bite. For as long as I'm in this circle and God is there, I dare that serpent to come and bite. That serpent will lose its head. Because it is the edge of God's protection. But when I break it, when I step out of that hedge, then the serpent can nip me. Hallelujah. One more and then I'll begin to close. Exodus 15, 26. And he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, you will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. He says, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians. Listen to what he says. For I am the Lord that healed thee, Jehovah Rapha. He says, I will not put it upon you, but peradventure it comes upon you, I will heal you. Because I am Jehovah your healer. Do you understand? Your, your, your knowledge of God gives you an edge in all that you do. You will not struggle where others are struggling. The Bible says the race is not to the swift. Neither is the battle to the strong. But God supplies all that you need. That's it. That's why people, some people do different. Everybody is doing the same thing, but one person succeeds. Success is given to those who follow the rules of God. Whether believer or unbeliever, if you follow the rules of God, the principles of God, success is yours. Now, now imagine if you are a believer. I close with this Job. God was so proud of Job that God said, Devil, come, come, come. Where have you been? He said, I've been going back and forth to and fro. Doing my, doing my duty of not being able to sleep, not being able to sit down, but just going back and forth every day, 24-7. And God said, good, you are doing your work. He said, now, have you seen my servant Job? He said, yeah. Ah, the devil, let me tell you something. The devil notices everything. He said, yes, I've seen him. He said, but I also saw that you built your edge of protection around him said, I have seen that you are there with him. He said, you just leave him for me for a few days or a few weeks and see if the man will not deny you. And God said, really? You want to bet? Hello? God said, go ahead. And the devil went, afflicted Job. You know, can you, the, the, the calamities that befell Job in one day. The devil is bad. All of Job's servants died. The devil left one to take bad news back. He left one. All his sons, his children were killed. He left one servant to escape to take the bad news back. All his, all his uh, treasures, his ship on the sea, everything sank. One person survived. One person swam out of the sea. So that he can go back and deliver bad news. Any messenger bringing bad news, I return you back to where you're coming from. Amen. May you not meet us at home in Jesus' name. Amen. Messengers of evil. And so the devil did that and, and they came and they told Job, everything has gone bad. This, you know, the worst part of it was they said, your children were in the house celebrating. And then the roof collapsed. And killed all of them. Hello? If they were in the... I can't fathom it. If the roofs was collapsing, coming from this side, I would run out that door. If I cannot run, I would hide under the chair. Is that also? But none of them could hide. And Job went through all that. At the beginning of Job 1, Job was the richest man in the East. At the end of Job 42, the Bible said Job was seven times richer than when he began. That means Job was number one. Job was number one when they started. There was a number two. There was a number three. 
By the time Job's the chapter was finished, Job was number one. There was no number two, no number three, no number four, no number five, no number six, no number seven. The closest to eight, Job was number eight. Because of the way God had blessed him back. Experience God in a way that no man can take God away from you. I'm telling you. Have a relationship that if they take everything, they can't take God away from you. You know, we, we were talking the other day. I'm, I'm closing now. And, you know, I remember, you know, the days, the days of old. When I would walk like about God knows how many kilometers to church. After I just got born again, I was on fire. How many of you were on fire when you first got born again? Nothing could stop you from church. You finish service on Sunday, you are like, do we still have evening service? And they tell you there's evening service. After evening service, do we still have prayer in the night? Yes, there's prayer. I will stay. And you will do all that. Your pastor comes and he says, oh, I fasted uh, 14 days without food, without water. And you're like, really? I will do 15 days. You are challenged by whatever he said. I remember that the time I took, I started that challenge, 15 days. I said, when my pastor said that, then I said, Mitch, I was going to do it. I got into my room and I locked the door, you know, 15 days, start of 15 days, and I began to pray. I prayed, pray, pray. I thought I had prayed a lot that I had, done, I had gone so much during the day. I checked my time. I'd only spent 15 minutes. <laughs> and I was heavy for 15 days. <laughs> I don't only spent 15 minutes. Then I went to sleep. I said, maybe by the time I wake up. And I slept. And I woke up one hour later. <laughs> so I've not even done 24 hours yet. <laughs> that was my, it was my longest struggle. By the time it was 5 o'clock, not even 6, I was ready to break the fast. I said, we'll do 15 days later. <laughs> not today. <laughs> You know, and I, by five o'clock, I went to look for uh, seven up. I said, you know, <laughs> and I broke the fast. I'm like, 15 days is not easy. <laughs> you know, that went, then I took the challenge again. I did two days. That went, later on, I took the challenge again. I did three days. Until one day, I realized you cannot do these things in the flesh. You only submit to the spirit and it is when you are called up to do it that you can do it. And when I was called up, I did it and I did not even feel it. When it was time to break, you know, you get to a point where you know it's time to break, you don't want to break. I don't know if you've got in there when you fast. You get to a time where you know, okay, it's done. But something within you now, you are so energized that you just want to keep going. And that's what happens. When you are called up, relationship will draw you in you know and that's why i understood that when moses spent 40 days with the lord the bible says listen to this a day with god is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day that means god could shrink 40 days into one day and the calendar will still read 40 days and moses in the presence of god would have felt like oh i spent only one day but it was 40 days relationship is the key you know, so as i close this afternoon one thing i want you to really examine is am i do i really have that personal relationship you know going to church is good seeing his act is good but do i have a personal encounter with him something that no matter what they cannot take away from me my wife cannot take away my relationship with god i cannot take away our relationship with god it's not possible no matter what I do, no matter what she does, we, we individually have our personal relationships with God. It's an individual thing. That's why I cannot pray the way she prays and she cannot pray the way I pray. The knowledge of God I have is different from the knowledge of God that she has. But when occasion warrants it and we bring it together, it's a beautiful thing. And that's what I'm asking you this morning. Do you have that relationship? Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Online, in-house, bow your heads and close your eyes right now. And ask yourself, do I have that relationship? I'm not talking about going to church. 
I'm not talking about knowing Christians. Or I'm not talking about, oh, religion. I am talking about a personal relationship. You know, as Peter said, he said, thou art Christ. Thou art Christ. He didn't say thou art Jesus. No, 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 no. He said thou art Christ. Thou art the Messiah. That's what he declared. Thou art Christ. Thou art the Savior. That was his revelation. And that's why Jesus went further and he said, Upon this revelation that Peter you have, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So do you have an encounter with Christ? If you don't, I want to help you this morning with a very, very simple commitment. I'm not, like I said, I'm not talking about going to church. So if you don't, just put your hands on your chest and say this prayer with me. And I'll begin to tell you, I'll lead you in a prayer. And after that, I will tell you what to do to have that revelation. Say with me, Heavenly Father. I come to you in the name of Jesus. I confess of all my sins. And I ask for forgiveness. I receive forgiveness right now. In the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Come and be my personal Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You know, if you said that prayer with me, you know, it doesn't end there. That's only the beginning. Now you need to propose. You need to determine that you really want to know him. Like you see, that prayer we said, nothing happened to you. You are still the same person you were two minutes ago before we said that prayer. But life can change if you do what I'm about to tell you. And the only thing I'm going to tell you is it's time to read the Bible. I'm not talking about listening to preachers. I'm talking about going into the Bible itself and begin to read the Bible. And I tell you the best book to start from, the book of John. Take that book and begin to read it. Read, first of all, read through the book of John. When you're done, now go back again and begin a study of the book of John. And as you read, I want you to pray a prayer every time you read. Lord, reveal yourself to me. Don't just read blindly. Before you open that book to read, pray and say, Lord, reveal yourself to me. I want to know you. I guarantee you before you, before you get to, to the end of the third chapter, you will have an experience that nobody can take away from you. I remember there was a time, you know, while I was praying to know the Lord and I was sleeping. You know, I had read the book of John and I was sleeping. And I woke up and, I'm not kidding, my form on the bed was made with water. I, I had sweat from my head to my toes on the bed. Nothing, nowhere else was wet. Just from my head, you know, if, if it was something else, you just see a portion, a pui, you know. But it was from my head to my toe. That was what was wet. Three days later, I slept. The entire bed was wet. Where I slept was dry. Where my form was, was dry. The entire bed was wet. And that's when I began my experience with God. Then I knew that God was real. And my relationship began to deepen. And then I began to see more of his ways than his heart. When I see a miracle, it is no longer a miracle to me, but the ways of God. And that's what I'm praying for somebody today. That God will reveal his ways to you. His ways. Part of his ways when he revealed it to me was when he told me how to stop drinking, how to stop smoking. That was part of his ways to me. So I pray somebody will experience him like never before in the name of Jesus. Because this month, we're going to need a revelation of his ways. And the Lord will reveal himself to us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.